It doesn't feel as warm in here as it does back in there, so that's good. But if you get hot, I don't mind you fanning yourselves, it's fine. Uh, quick intro about me. For those of you who don't know me, I, I will walk up and down the stage, try not to get dizzy. It just means that I don't stand rooted to the spot like I'm scared, because I'm not. Um, I've been in testing for a long time. Think 30 plus years, I'm not telling you the plus. Um, I'm currently working at EasyJet. I've been there since the end of January, Senior Quality Engineering Manager. It's a real challenge working in an airline industry. Anybody who was delayed on their flights over, if it was EasyJet, I'm sorry. It's not always our fault, okay? Um, I've spoken at conferences, I blog, I guested on a couple of podcasts this year, which is great. It's the first time I've done it. I'm still doing firsts this long in my career. It's brilliant. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. And does anybody here love radio? Yep. Anyone love music? I do a four-hour radio show every Saturday in the UK uh, as a hobby. I absolutely love it. If you want to talk radio with me, give me a chat later. But we're not here about that. We're here about things I wish I'd known back 20 years ago. And I don't know how many people are in leadership roles, just to show hands. Is anybody sort of leading others? Yeah. Is anybody about to go into a new leadership role? If there's anyone about to go into it, maybe. It's hard, right? Leading other people is really hard. You go from an individual contributor to suddenly, I have to care about all these people. I worked for an American bank, and they, uh, I was managing one person. It was great, because we were mates. I used to just be able to say to him, that's rubbish, and we'd just laugh. i go, you're fired, and we joke about it. And they said, could you do us a favor? Could you manage a team of eight people? The manager's going on a three-month sabbatical. He'll be back. He's leaving some handover notes, and we'll support you. And I believed them. <laughs> Guess what? No handover notes, okay? I didn't know anything the team had done, and their appraisals were due three months later. Stress one. Number two, no support. And worst of all, they knew when they asked me that he wasn't coming back. So I was set up for failure from day one. Now, I'm the type of person who takes the job seriously, and I felt, I'm responsible for eight people here. I need to do my best. I literally killed myself doing it. I got into a very dark place, almost depression. And I've never told this story publicly. You are the first people that I've told this to in 20 years. And it burned me so much, it took me six years before I took another leadership position. And I wanted to share that story in the hope that some of what I went through can actually help anybody else who might be going through that. So it's quite a personal story. So Fast forward about 15, 20 years. And I could have done hindsight glasses. Like, imagine if you got set high. You'd never work again, would you? You'd be so rich. But with the benefit of hindsight, I kept hearing things, people talking about you know, anxiety, stress, mental health. We didn't talk about that 10 or 20 years ago. It was all very quiet. You kept it in. And I kept thinking, do you know, if I knew that back then, I'd have done something differently, or I would have asked for help. So I started to keep a list of things, and I thought, why don't I share that? And then a talk is born. So that's why we're here. So where are we going to start? These are the black clouds I'm going to talk about. I purposely done them as black clouds because I felt a weight on me as I was going through this. It culminated one Sunday. I knew I had a problem because I hated going to work. But I never took a sickie. I wish I had. I never went to the doctor. Should have done. I was the only wage earner because my little lad was small. My wife wanted to take a few years out. So the pressure of being the only wage earner and not wanting to go home and tell my wife in case I felt you know, like a failure. So I carried all these black clouds around in my head. And one Sunday, or one Saturday, we went to a family party, my brother's birthday. I felt nothing, no emotion, I was so flat. I just could not enjoy it. The next day I went to church, and at the end they said, look, if anybody needs any prayer or a chat, there's two people down sitting there. Do you know I was halfway down before my brain realized I was moving? I needed it, and I sat down with an older bloke, and I said a little bit about the problem. He said, you know what, I don't know about computers, but I know about people. And that was the start of the weight lifting, the start of me actually talking about it, get, trying to understand what I need to do differently. It's a happy ending, because I got out of there after six months, and I went for a much better job. In fact, it was so bad, I went for a job paying about 10,000 pounds less than I was on, and my wife said, you know what, if, if I have to go back to work, you just go. 
And when I went in, they said to me, you're overqualified, but I need a lead position. So immediately I got elevated up. So it, it did have a good ending. Just wish I hadn't had to go through all this first. Anyway, things I wish I knew about anxiety. Anxiety runs in my family. My mum's anxious. My son is anxious. It just passes down. You can't really do much about it. But back then, I kind of thought I was the only one. You know, how many of, how many of you, you, know, you don't have to put your hands up, but how many of you, just a nod, sometimes feel when you go through things that you're the only one going through it because everyone else looks like they've got their shit together. Excuse my French. Yeah? Okay. Good. Whew. You didn't leave me hanging. I love you guys. Uh, <laughs> many people who look confident. Do I look confident? Good. It might be a persona. You know, my first public talk wasn't until maybe 12 years ago, quite late in my career, because I didn't feel I had the confidence. I can do radio because I can't see you. <laughs> I, can, I can sit behind a mic. But actually, I have been out and I've done things that I thought I'd never, ever do. But you put a persona. If I walk into the studio on a Saturday morning and I don't think, right, I'm now Radio Steve, I get my head straight, I struggle. And it's almost like switching on something in your head. Different people wear personas, so what you're doing, I would tell my younger self, first of all, I'm not the only one, everyone has anxieties, and comparing myself to that person who looks really confident doesn't work, because what they're showing me is the, is the part of them that they want me to see. They're showing me that confident persona, but behind it, they're probably struggling as much as I am. So me thinking, why can't I be like them, doesn't work. And all the times that I used to worry about things going wrong, I never actually stopped to think I wasted so much time on that. It never happened. I just went straight to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And I would tell myself to plan ahead. How can I mitigate some of these things that are really worrying me? So I get a little bit of anxiety, low-level anxiety, traveling on my own. Especially when I'm flying. I hate going through all that airport experience. It stresses me a little bit. And I felt that yesterday. But I planned ahead. I need to drive 60 miles to the airport. I need to get there at a certain time. When am I going to leave? What am I going to do? I'm going to check Google Maps a few times so I know I leave at the right time. I know where I'm parking. I have to get it all listed out. It sounds really rubbish, but it's the way I cope with it. And talking to someone to get a different perspective, we get stuck in our heads. You've got to talk to someone, and that's what I would tell myself. Another thing that I struggled with was expectations. I would assume, like going into this new leadership role, this is what the manager is going to need from me. I didn't ask. And making assumptions about what you think people want from you adds stress. Okay. Trying to over deliver. So I'm thinking they're going to want me to do this, 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 and this. That's stressful. You know, you're, you're setting yourself up to fail because you've not actually checked. And the thing as well, you know, when two different people ask you to do something, I used to take that on myself. And I look back and I'm thinking, what the heck? That's not my problem. If two people ask me to do something in the same time, I need to say, you talk to one another and tell me what you want me to do. Why should I own it? But the younger me didn't have the confidence to go, hang on a minute, because I was worried what they would think. And it's okay to ask. I used to think, oh, if I ask questions, are people gonna think I'm a bit silly? Are they gonna think I don't know what I'm doing? So I would tell my younger self, get that clarification. Don't assume that you need to give gold level service. There's a story behind this. I did a project, not product management role alongside my test manager role. I loved it because we got a product to market, an Excel plugin. You could download commodity prices and do what you liked with it all. I was kidding myself trying to give the best service to the product owner. And my boss sat down and he said to me, what are you doing? I said, well, I need to do this, this. He went, hold on, you're giving gold level service. How do you know that bronze isn't good enough? Have you asked? It's like, <laughs> smack in the face. Again. I assume too much. If something is unachievable, push back and just say politely, don't just go no, but you know, I'm already doing this or I don't have the team to do this or I haven't got the time or whatever it be, what would you suggest? Who do we need to help? But also set my expectations of them. I would tell myself, my younger self, if somebody asked me to do something, turn around and say to them, so will you be around to ask questions? And make sure that they don't just offload to me. Because I took that and I shouldn't have done. And from a hard lesson, I would draft out an email 
and I'd fire it off and go, so you're asking me to look after a team for a few months, there will be a handover, and it's all in writing. Because I had nothing to go back on, and that was the problem. I couldn't go back and go, but you said. Unrealistic self-standards, this is where we put pressure on ourselves. And there's a perception that everyone is perfect and no one makes mistakes. Hands up if you're perfect. Good. Oh, one did, you almost, almost. <laughs> yeah, we're not perfect, but we don't like, we don't like, hands up if you'd love to tell everyone you've made mistakes. There's a few people, good, because not everyone likes to do that. We don't always work in environments where making mistakes is acceptable. Air traffic control, yeah, you don't want that. But if you work in somewhere where, okay, no one's going to die, no one's going to lose a billion pounds, billion euros, billion whatever it is, you know, it should be supportive. You only learn by making mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're not really learning. Perfect is the enemy of good. I really like that. And if you're a perfectionist, people get a little bit wary because if you're working up here, people are looking going, I can't reach that. Now, if they can't reach that, you're going to turn them off. They're not going to want to work with you. So that's one thing that I would wish I'd known because I was trying to be perfect, but I can't be. And the other thing is, I don't know whether any of you criticize yourselves. I look back and I think, why, why am I doing that? There's plenty of other people out there that will criticize me, and very few that would probably back me up. So I need to be my own self-advocate, as do each of you. Don't criticize yourselves. Plenty of people will do that for you. This is a really good thing. Take that away if you need to. You don't have to be perfect. You can be good. If I'd have read that 20 years ago, it would have really hit me. It's like, wow, yes, I can just be good enough. So what would I tell my younger self? Be realistic about my own expectations. Share mistakes with other people because it shows that I'm human. And think about what the attitude I want to show to the team. Do I want to show that it's okay to make a, a simple mistake and learn? Yeah, of course. Do I want to show it's okay to speak out and tell people? Yes. Uh, imposter syndrome. Oh, giving the game away. Right. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to be really brave now. I'm going to ask you to do a show of hands. How many of you struggle with imposter syndrome? Because I do. Thank you. You're just proving the first point. Hooray! <laughs> it is very common. And especially when you move into a new leadership role, it's that fear of like they're going to find me out. I'm not sure I'm good enough. And I, again, always thought it was just me because everyone else looks really confident. But there are senior leaders and politicians that have spoken out later and said that they struggle with imposter syndrome. These people that are on TV or in parliaments or whatever, and they look like they know what they're doing, they're just as worried as some of us. And I started going back to the job that I did previously, a bit of a comfort blanket. You don't know this piece over here, but you know your old job, so I'm just going to go back and do a little bit of this. And that's a classic. I thought, it must be a bit odd, but actually it's classic behaviour. And it comes and goes, because you'll have good days and bad days. Some days you'll wake up and you go, where's my, re my really leery shirt? Because bring it on, world, I'm ready. And another day it's like, where's the grey? I want to hide. You know, we don't always feel confident every day. It's true. So I would tell my younger self that having doubts is fine. It's absolutely OK. But just don't get fixated on what I don't know. Just remind myself that I do know stuff. I was put in the role for a good reason. Someone thinks I can do that. And I don't, there's no comfort blanket. Why do I need a comfort blanket? Okay. Go from the left-hand side, from the I don't deserve to be here, right across. You know, you're trusting the judgment of someone who's asked you to do something. Generally, 99% of the time, it's from good intentions. It's not to stitch you up. Mine was the 1%. And you're here because you've earned it. Imposter syndrome gets two slides because this blew my mind. I never realized, but imposter syndrome is not a negative thing. I thought it was negative. It actually isn't. Look up, look up Stephen Bartlett. Some of you might know him from the UK TV program, Dragon's Den. He's got a really good YouTube thing where he talks about seeking out imposter syndrome. Sounds kind of weird, but he said if he doesn't seek it out, he knows he's not learning. That's amazing. So it's positive. Life is meant to be a challenge. So I would tell my younger self to step outside the comfort zone. Because how am I going to grow if I, if I only stick with what I know? It's not going to work. Where are the gaps? Actually, don't think, oh, I don't know stuff. Just think, okay, what is it I don't know how to do? Is it giving negative feedback? Is it raising a purchase order? Is it doing 
you know, whatever it is. Once I know that, I can then work out, so how am I going to fix the things that I don't know how to do? Who do I need to speak to? Come up with a plan. Difficult people. I had a team of eight people that I was managing. One of them was an underachiever. Another one was only 21 with a massive attitude problem. And she hated the fact that I came in to manage her team because you don't know what we work on. And it's really one of those things where you're a new manager and it's like, oh, I don't want to have to deal with that. You just don't like conflict. It's really difficult. We can't change difficult people and we can't change their attitudes. And it's actually normal to want to avoid it. You know, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would imagine none of us actually want confrontation. Who wants to go to work to have arguments? You go to work because you want to enjoy it. And leaving things to fester. I left that situation too long before I addressed it because I didn't know how to. I'd had no management training. There was no one there to ask, how do I deal with this person who's given me such a hard time? So I let it go. It led to my anxiety and stress. More and more thinking, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to deal with it? And I kind of took it on as something I'd done. And then I realized later on, that's not my fault. If someone has an attitude problem, that's their, their, their fault. Don't own it. Don't own something that someone else is. So I would tell my younger self to think about the outcome because that's what I didn't do. I didn't think, so what do I want out of this situation? What does good look like? Find a mentor, someone to talk to. Perhaps rehearse that conversation and give you feedback. I would have spoken to HR and my line manager. Both at the time weren't particularly great, I have to say. But remain professional. A couple of times in my career where I've not done that when dealing with confrontation, it has not left me feeling good, and it didn't help me to win the argument either. Whether I was right or not, losing your temper does not work, so I would remind myself that now. And it dented my confidence. I let that situation make me doubt myself. I would tell my younger self, you still know what you're doing. That person's attitude is not down to you. You know your stuff. And vulnerability, the last one. I used to see opening up and talking about stuff as a bit of a weakness. Aren't we, aren't we men supposed to be strong, right? Yeah, 20 years ago. Now is actually we're meant to be strong by telling people that we don't know things and being honest. I did that stupid man thing of trying to, I'm okay, I'm fine. And thinking people will judge you or criticize, actually, I realize that that's not the case. There are some really good people in this world that will support and help you. And it sets a good example to the team that you're working with if you can be open and share your vulnerabilities with them. Obviously, you don't sit there in front of your team and go, guys, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, be <laughs> careful what you share. But it builds your character as well. So I would tell my younger self, firstly, admit what I don't know. That's the hardest thing. To admit to myself, or for any of us, to admit what we do not know. Find someone to, that you trust. That's easier now. I've got a lot more friends in the testing space than I had back then. So I know who I would reach out to, who would give me good advice. But to see it as a growth opportunity, that's the thing. Okay, I grow by being, showing my vulnerability to others. And then encourage the team. What kind of leader you know, do I want to be? So thinking back, that's what I would have done. But the good news, it's getting better. Society has changed. Right? We talk about this stuff, don't we? We talk about mental health now. We talk more openly. It's acceptable to say to someone, do you know what? I'm struggling. Can you help me? Okay. We don't have to pretend anymore, which is amazing news. That should get a few smiles. Come on. So... Beware, everything is not fine. Fine is the worst word in the English language. If you say to someone, how are you, and they say fine, it generally means that either they're like, or they're, you know, they're not, but they don't want to tell you. So, some practical advice. If you've got concerns and anxieties, here's a few things you could do. I'm not saying that it would work for everybody. You make your own list up, but you might think, okay, let's get it all out, let's make a list. I feel better off for offloading it. Now, catastrophize. Well, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, the train might come off the rails. What's the likelihood? We all think the worst is going to happen, but actually it never really does. Perhaps find someone to talk to. And get a different viewpoint. Don't get stuck in your head. It's not a good place. Managing expectations. Three simple things here. Don't assume what people want from you. Ask. Because if you don't assume, you start worrying. Are you giving gold service when you don't need to give gold service? 
Bronze or silver is enough. And there's only one of you. There's only so much that you as an individual can do. This one, I want you to imagine that you've got a baseball bat in your hand. Okay, and I want to imagine I'm throwing something at you called imposter syndrome. I want you to bash the hell out of it and tell it to go. Because you deserve to be in the job. Every single one of you deserves to be in the jobs that you're in today. Whether you think it or not, somebody believes that you're the right person to do the role that you're in. Someone has shown you that belief. The only person who expects you to know everything is you. No one puts you in a role and says on day one, you have to know every single thing. We said that ourselves. Every day should be a school day. You should always be learning. Be open and honest. Admit to yourself the things that you're not comfortable with. You can't move on unless you do. Speak to someone you trust. And don't be too proud to take on help. I'm going to whip through quickly because I'm slightly over. Be an ally. This is the most important thing. I've talked about each of us as individuals, but actually, what can we do for other people? We can do all these things here. You can look out for others. If someone says to you, I'm fine, does their body language match what they're saying? And if it doesn't, be that person to listen. And really listen. Don't solutionize. Don't offer people solutions. They don't want that. Just listen to what they're saying. Don't judge. But look out for one another. That's what I'd say. Being an ally is so important. If somebody knows that they can talk to you, you might save someone a lot of stress. So finally, here's the takeaways. Talk about mental health struggles. If you're comfortable, not forcing you to do anything you don't want to do, but make it a natural conversation. Don't force it. Role model the behavior that you want others in your teams to see and that you want to encourage. Create that open culture. It's okay to talk about it. Be a compassionate leader. Don't just think of tasks, think of people. Yeah, don't be transactional. You know, you have a one-to-one -one with your team. What are you working on today? How are you? How are you doing? How are you finding the workload? Is there anything I can do to help? Is there anything you need to learn? You know, ask those questions and be an ally to others. Those are the most important things. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah, I arrived slowly to this a, a bit over. because I didn't want to put some pressure on you, but we have to give a huge applause one more time for Steve Watson. Thank you very much. I think we have time only for one question. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Sadly, but let's check. We will show the question or and I can read it. How to bring motivation in team members? Oh, how to bring motivation in team members. Um, I think, first of all, listening to people and showing them that they're valued. You know, if people don't feel like they're valued, they're not going to be motivated to work with you. You know, the best managers that I've had are the people that care. And not just about the tasks, but they care about me as an individual. And that's what gains your loyalty. And when you've got someone's loyalty, you get the motivation. You give them growth opportunities. You find out what it is that they want to do. How can you help them? And I think that's, that to me is the main thing. Can we check one more question? I think yes. So We've got a couple of minutes, I think, on the timer. So. Uh, yes. Unless that's... But, okay. We, we changed that number, so... Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So how to make our team members active and curious in their job? Sometimes they're Ooh. so slow and not curious to do work. It impacts deliverables. Ooh, that's, that's an interesting one. I don't know if people are, are slow. I'm not sure how much I'd agree with that, but how to make team members active and curious. I think it kind of goes back to how to bring motivation, really. They're, they're very similar. Uh, if you give people opportunities to learn, but maybe ask them what they want to do. So when I ran a team a couple of years ago, I said to them, there's lots of different areas in testing. Go pick one. Tell me what it is. Stick it on a confidence page. Come back and do a talk to the team about an area you've picked. And every single person picked a different area. So someone went off and looked at security. Someone did accessibility. Someone did performance. You're given that chance to go and find something they're really interested in, bring it back and implement it. So I think that would make them active and curious. So. I'm just checking that maybe we, can, we have one more. Uh, I mean, we have time for one more question. What do you think, which small change in your professional past would have the biggest positive impact in your present? I love that question. Yeah, that's really uh, good. It's really making me think back. If I go back to the dark days, I'm calling the dark days of like 2002 when I was really, really struggling, um, what small change? For me, it would have been to talk to someone. 
if I'd have spoken to somebody about the issues that I was facing, if perhaps I'd have even spoken to the doctor and got signed off for a couple of weeks and had a break, I might have been able to reset. I might have been able to think a bit more about how do I deal with this horrible situation, but I never had a break to kind of step back and see it from a different viewpoint. So that, I think, would have helped me, definitely. So my advice is if you're ever in that situation where things are so overwhelming, don't struggle on your own. Talk to somebody, because that was, would have been a small thing that would have changed everything.